I've saved the worst for last. Our triple feature ends with Voyager, truly the pinnacle of UPN's many achievements. I've been getting a lot of messages questioning why I've not included the original Star Trek in this marathon, and I don't know if you know this, but there's 50 years worth of material here, so I'd appreciate a little patience with my watch time. I do know from the comments I've probably already got an episode selected for the future, though, but I guess I'll cross that bridge when I come to it. Yeah, I haven't watched the original series yet, so what? You already accepted that I watched Enterprise first, so I got nothing else to lose in admitting that. But I can tell you immediately it's going to be better than Voyager, because oh man, rarely has a show not held up so badly as my revisiting this mess. It is a mean-spirited, clunky show, constantly falling short of its potential, but with some occasional moments of brilliance hoisted up by a talented cast. And that's something that's new to me, because I remember sort of liking it as a kid. If we're going to be pedantic about this, Enterprise really wasn't my first Star Trek. My dad's a Trekkie, and he didn't care for Deep Space Nine, so the Trek I saw as a kid was Voyager. Two things of note. One, I was not terribly invested in it, and two, I remembered next to nothing of it rewatching these as an adult. Though Voyager and Enterprise are probably the reasons that for so long I associated Trek with boring status reports and techno babble. I did, however, recall thinking Seven of Nine was cool, and since I was a kid with terrible taste and my favorite character was always the most annoying and loathed, I liked Neelix. But all of this was sort of images in the periphery of my mind. I couldn't really tell you about specific episodes or plots, or even really the premise of the show outside of people in space. One episode, however, that I have a vivid recollection of seeing the night it aired was Threshold. And oh man, what an episode to stick with me all these years. I had no context for why anything was happening, however, so here's something new for adult me to gape at in horror. Let me be a little fairer here. Voyager did improve after the first two or three seasons in pacing and character moments. They did backslide in the sexism department, but I guess that's a whole other can of worms. Well, Threshold comes to us smack dab in the middle of season two. So not only is it bad, it's a bad episode that stands out in a season of bad episodes. In fact, it is infamously Voyager's worst episode ever. So let's cross the Threshold together. We begin with Paris running simulations to reach Warp 10, something that's never been done before, a hobby he's testing out, oh, in his downtime. Of course, a nice bonus of reaching Warp 10 would be getting Voyager out of the Delta Quadrant and back home. The downside is that he keeps making a shuttle go boom. <laughs> Now might be a bad time for me to mention that I am not a terribly scientifically inclined person, so while this episode might get a lot of stuff wrong, if you want a mission log style analysis of the how and why, me too stupid. So I don't know, you try and suss out this word salad. A subspace torque. A duranium alloy. More coffee? A quantum warp theory. Multispectral subspace engine design. The maximum warp barrier. Infinite velocity. But a new form of dilithium. A much higher warp frequency. Dark matter nebula. A dark matter bow wave. Subspace stress on the nacelles. Tritanium alloy. Depolarize. A velocity differential. Fuselage. A depolarization matrix. More coffee? The short version. Our crew of space nerds can't figure out how to go warp 10 because it's a theoretical impossibility. If you ignore all of those other times in Trek where people went warp 10 or more, and also the very premise of the show. But maybe Neelix, comic relief hedgehog and self-proclaimed first chef in Star Trek, can throw a little quantum warp theory magic their way. Infinite velocity. Got it, so that, that means very fast. He does not. If, however, someone did manage to break Warp 10, they'd be going at infinite speeds, meaning they'd occupy all points of the universe simultaneously. But with the discovery of a new form of dilithium, this theoretical impossibility might just become possible. A short anecdote by Neelix gives Paris an idea that can maybe stop their shuttle from falling apart once it reaches the threshold. So basically, six minutes into this, Tom Paris has solved a theoretical impossibility over lunch. This is just like a means to a very stupid end in this episode. It's super important to Paris personally that he completes this flight and breaks Warp 10 because of his lingering daddy issues and thirst to prove that he's more than the man who ended up in prison for crimes against Starfleet. I find it suspect that Janeway is telling him he shouldn't risk the flight due to a 2% chance of his death. Well, I weighed my options and, when given the choice between needlessly endangering a crew member and destroying their dreams, I went with the one that has the most prolonged amount of suffering. 
please. Please let me make the flight. Beg for your life, Cretan. Hey, it's me, Raphael Sabarge, and I'm still here. Stay tuned for the epic conclusion of my multi-episode arc where I get thrown into a big green fart hole by Neelix. Uh. Akuchi Moya, am I right, Captain? Shut up, Chikote, you're on report. Just poop the shuttle out, and away we go. <laughs> sure enough, our hero shatters the world record and reaches Warp 10. Truly a momentous occasion, as you can see. Warp 10. Yes. <laughs> they get a little worried when he disappears for a bit, but it's just for a dramatic commercial break, and he manages to swing back around. Yes. Considering his plan literally boiled down to occupy all points of the universe simultaneously and then break really fast, I'm kind of baffled he was able to control where he ended up somehow. Being everywhere all at once wipes Tom out, so he takes a little trip to sickbay. Can you wake him? I don't see why not. Wake up, Lieutenant! The doctor's the best. He's got to try that trick on Chakotay sometime. For a moment, I was everywhere. It was like... Well, no, it wasn't like anything. Truly a life-shattering experience. Well, that's never gonna be brought up again. Hey, we gonna get to the dumb salamanders or whatever? Look, I've never traveled Warp 10, but I'm gonna call bullshit on their computers somehow being able to map and store information on every part of the universe. Also, this doesn't come up again either. If we could figure out how to come out of Trans Warp at a specific point, this could get us home. Well, duh, just do what Tom did. Magic. Wait till Seska hears about this. Please care about my plot. The biggest mistake Paris makes, however, is drinking some of Neelix's coffee. Damn you, Neelix! The ship is mine now! Eh, eh, eh. Check out A, you're on report. Whoa, these Dingle Dong readings are off the charts. Well, things aren't going so good for Tom right now. In fact, for some reason, he's slowly mutating into something else. Pepperoni! God, I'd love a pepperoni pizza with Kaverian olives right now. I'm starving! He's got bad lineitis. It's too late for him now. Better start grooming Harry to be his replacement. Yes. Tell Harry, I never really liked him. I just hung out with him because he made me look cooler. <clears throat> Dying's the least of Paris's problems, however, because pretty soon he's back and flakier than ever. His transformation into Brundle Tom is almost complete. Pretty disgusting, huh? By the way, this episode won an Emmy for makeup, and I'm not knocking on it because Michael Westmore is great and this is suitably gross, but it is also hilarious to me that you can truthfully say Emmy award-winning episode threshold. Maybe that's why you can go to eBay right now and buy a mutated Tom Paris action figure for five bucks, because that's what kids wanted in 1996 or ever. Not only is Tom changing on the outside, but he's changing on the inside as well. Sure, he's transforming beyond recognition, but come on, he was a total disappointment before. How do you know this isn't the best thing that's ever happened to me? Noted. Doctor, shoot him out the airlock. <laughs> Gross. Hey man, you tell me if I look stupid, right? Oh yeah, uh, totally. Do I look stupid? Well, uh, you know, the design needs some work. What the hell, man? This episode won an Emmy for makeup effects. Yeah, but not like... Not for yours. You know what? Screw you, man. Carnosaur sucked. I was also in The Hidden. Eh, the Hidden was alright. The Hidden too. This call is over. I believe the answer lies in forcing his DNA to revert to its original coding. Once that occurs, his body should return to its former anti state. Antiprotons? The only place on this ship which generates antiprotons is the warp core. We'll have to take the warp core offline, then I'll need about three hours to set up an interface. You know, maybe Paris was right. Maybe this was the best thing that's ever happened to him. Some sort of primal instinct is taking over, leading Tom towards some other destination. So via the lamest off-screen fight ever conceived, he breaks out of his restraints and runs away. I can't believe Janeway's skull is made out of paper mache. Someone's depressurizing shuttle bay too. What? Holy shit, don't fly off the handle, Chakote. What? Well, I know Janeway and Paris went warp 10 and occupied all places in the universe, but lucky for Voyager, they landed, I don't know, right over there. 
As they close in on their missing crewmates after three days of searching space blindly, the doctor thinks he has an explanation for what's been happening. The changes in his DNA are consistent with the evolutionary development of the human genotype. Increased brain capacity, the loss of vestigial organs. Are you saying Lieutenant Paris is evolving? What? Pardon? Excuse me? What? <laughs> okay, so, so apparently, by going so fast, he was everywhere at once. Paris sped up the natural human evolutionary process by millions of years and became humanity's future. So, so okay, Voyager, why don't you show us what's in store? Come on now, come on, that's not really it, come on. You try and explain to me how this is what humans are going to evolve into. Like, what traits specifically were an improvement? I was unaware that this is how evolution works, but looks like Star Trek set me straight. The only thing I can possibly think of during this scene is the poor puppeteers who had to get into the salamander suits and crawl around on their bellies pretending to be mutated Paris and Janeway. Behold, evolution! It's time to play the music! It's time to light the light! It's time to meet the Muppets on the Muppet Show tonight! Wait, how long is this gestation period? They were only gone for three days! Holy shit, Salamander Janeway and Paris get around! Yes! Well, lucky for them, they were able to cure evolutionary Salamander off screen! Easy peasy! But wait, why would they want to go back to being puny old humans when they can be super amphibious humans from the future? So, question, if this is so easy to cure, why don't they just use Warp 10 to get back to Earth and then just fix everyone after? They've got at least one crew member who we know won't be affected, so really, this is a viable solution. But oh well, guess this story is gonna be forgotten. As we all wanted. Hey, Captain, do you think it's a bad idea for the show to have an episode where we turn into salamanders and have children together and brush it off with no psychological consequences? What makes you think it was your idea? Sometimes it's the female of a species that initiates mating. Well, that makes it okay, then. In probably the only thing that works about this story, Tom realizes that breaking the threshold was really just a quick fix for him, and his true happiness has to be found within himself. And the only reason this was included was because Robert Duncan McNeil helped them rewrite the scene so he could find something deeper to ground this story. So basically, he was trying to find the nugget of gold in the salamander stew. Well, Threshold has a deserved reputation. It's pretty hard to justify any of the science, and, you know, it's just plain silly. But here's what credit I'll give it. The makeup is fantastic, and the body horror is satisfyingly gross. While it is ridiculous, it makes the journey leading up to it really interesting to watch. Robert Duncan McNeil is acting his heart out, and through pounds and pounds of makeup. And I think that's something that's really hard to do, so props to him. Everything about Threshold falls apart under any scrutiny, but you can definitely enjoy a laugh at its expense. And you might disagree, but maybe you're just not evolved enough to get it.